Welcome back. My name is Matt Gracie, and I'm an engineer on the professional services team at Security Onion Solutions. Earlier, we talked about three common workflows for using the Security Onion platform. In this session, we're going to cover the first one, alert triage and case creation. We're going to look at our alerts in the Security Onion console, or SOC. We're going to triage them to determine which ones merit further investigation, dismiss some false positives, and escalate one as a case in the case management tool. Then we'll dig into the data in our environment so that you can see how these tools work together to enable and record your investigation. By the end of this video, you should be familiar with the alert and cases interfaces that are an integral part of using Security Onion. Let's get started. To begin, open up the Security Onion console in your web browser using the username and password that you established during installation. Once you log in, you'll see that all of the components of Security Onion are listed on the menu along the left-hand side of the browser window. For this workflow, we're starting with the Alerts interface, so click on the Alerts link in the upper left corner of the screen. It's the one with the bell icon. This will open the Alerts interface, which is a central clearinghouse for the alerts raised by the various components of the Security Onion platform. Our assumption for this workflow is that you, as an analyst, will be periodically checking this interface for new alerts and evaluating them to determine which ones can be dismissed and which ones are indicative of potential malicious activity and so require further investigation. Let's take a look at the different options here in the alerts interface, and then we'll look at the triage process itself. Now, looking at the top of the alerts interface, you'll see there's an options menu with a dropdown. If we click on that, we'll see some options for how alerts are presented to us in this interface. Acknowledged alerts are alerts that have been evaluated and dismissed by either yourself or by another analyst with access to this platform. So if we click this toggle, it will show us those alerts, the ones that have already been evaluated and dismissed. Escalated alerts are alerts that an analyst decided required further investigation, so they've been escalated into the case management platform. So if we click this toggle, it will show us our escalated alerts. We'll go through the process for how we acknowledge or escalate alerts in just a moment. The refresh interval allows us to have the alerts console automatically refresh periodically so that we can see new alerts that have come in while we've been working. And finally, the time zone option allows us to set the time zone that alert data is displayed in. By default in Security Onion, data is recorded in UTC and then displayed according to the time zone settings of your browser. However, if you want to change that, you can do it here and the timestamps of the various data that you're looking at will be updated accordingly. Continuing on with the tour of the interface, in the upper right corner, you can see that this test data has 191 alerts in it altogether. Uh, there are some duplicates, which you can see below in the count column, but there are 191 individual alerts altogether. That is the count for the preceding 12 hours. By default, this is set up in relative time. If you want to change the time frame, you can do that either by clicking here to change the number of hours, or by clicking over here on hours to change it to another unit of measurement, for example, days or weeks. If you would rather use absolute time instead of relative time, you can do that by clicking on this clock icon here. It will change to a calendar and it'll allow you to set a precise uh, time frame from which to pull alerts. Let's change that back to relative time. Over here on the left, we see that there is a query which is returning these alert results by default, alerts are grouped by name and module. Name in this case is the rule name. That is, what is the name of the rule that caused the alert to fire? Module is which component of Security Onion caused the alert to raise. So if we look down here, we'll see this first item here, GPL, NetBIOS, SMB, DS, Unicode, Share Access, uh, raised by Suricata, that is our network IDS. So there was probably some network traffic that matched this signature. It was noticed by Suricata, an alert was raised, and according to the Suricata rules database, this is a low severity event. So that is what the alerts interface looks like. We can change the query up here at the top. So if we want to group by something else, for example, source IP, and look for which IPs are raising the most alerts, we can do that here. We can also group it by things like destination IP or port. We can even ungroup and just see all the alerts raw if that's, uh, if that's helpful for us. But by default, it groups by name and module, and that's a 
pretty helpful configuration to start with for an investigation. If we want to investigate only high priority alerts, there's two ways we could do that. One would be to click on this column header so that it says high and then only investigate the top part of the display. Another option would be to click on that severity label of high with our left mouse button, not our right. It'll give us a pop-up window and then we can hit include and it will add that to our query at the top here. So we are now grouping by rule name, event module, and event severity label, but we are only interested in event severity label high. And you'll see if we scroll down, all that is here are high severity alerts. So let's get rid of that. Now, when we see an alert with multiple counts here, that means that multiple pieces of network traffic match the same signature. So for example, if we are interested in um, this GPL SNMP public access UDP, we can either click on the rule itself and click on drill down, or we can just click on the number and that will do the same thing. In this case, we'll click on the menu and it will show us these are the eight times that this rule fired. Uh, they appear to be in pretty rapid succession. They're all coming from the same source IP. They're all coming from the same source port. They're all going to the same destination IP and destination port. So this is eight separate incidences of essentially the same traffic. If we go back here to our default screen, we find our SNMP public access here. We say, you know what, this is known good traffic. That source IP was my network monitoring solution. The destination IP was my core router. I expect SNMP lookups to be happening there. We can go over to this bell icon, click it to acknowledge the alert, and you'll see it disappears from our alert queue. That is, we have evaluated it. We have determined that it is not something that requires more investigation. So we can just take it out of the alert queue entirely so that no more analysts waste their time looking at it. As I mentioned earlier, if we want to look at acknowledged alerts, we can do that. We have to open up this options menu, click on acknowledged, and we'll see there's our SNMP public access UDP alert. But we have acknowledged that, so it's gone from our active event queue, and now we can concentrate on the things that may actually be malicious or require more investigation. If you have something like that SNMP alert that is coming up periodically and you don't want your analysts wasting time on it, uh, the best thing to do would be to tune that rule. How we do that is a little bit beyond the scope of this video, but there's plenty of information on our YouTube channel and on our documentation site. Uh, tuning a rule can be anything from ignoring an IP outright to turning off a particular rule to turning off a particular rule for a particular IP. It can be very fine grained. So if you have something like this, for example, uh, a small number of known hosts that you expect to be generating SNMP traffic and you want to exclude them but alert if anyone else does it, that's totally possible. It's very easy to do. And you can check out our documentation site for more information. So now that we've looked at that, let's take a look at something that may require a little more investigation. This one in particular, Zbot post request to C2. This one in particular caught my eye because generally speaking, if you see a post request to a C2, that means you're dealing with a compromised endpoint that's already fairly far down the attack chain. So some piece of malware has been installed on this, it's established uh, persistence or at least initial access, and it's reaching out to a C2 for further details. So let's click on that. I will click on the count number here for the quick drill down so we can see all of the incidences of Zbot post request to C2. Now looking at this, we've got a few different source IPs. We've got 3.65, 3.25, and 3.35 to choose from. And it appears that they're all going to different destination IPs, but they're going on the same destination port, port 80. So this is C2 traffic coming from a few of our different endpoints, going to a few different destination IPs in some sort of C2 network, but it's all going over port 80, which is good because that means it's most likely unencrypted traffic. It's just going over standard HTTP. If we want more details on one of these alerts, we can click on this caret icon on the left here. That'll open up and it'll give us all the metadata about this alert. What is the destination IP? Uh, what is the geo IP for it? 
what module raised the alert, what is the actual alert message, and so on. Probably the most important thing to look at first is the rule itself. This will tell us what characteristics the traffic had that it matched and fired this alarm. So here we see it says from our home network, that is from our internal network, to an external network somewhere out on the internet. Uh, there's a established flow to a server. It is posting to a PHP page with certain HTTP headers in place and so on. So it looks like this is a fairly granular rule that's looking for this particular C2 traffic. If we scroll up, we'll see this characteristic here, network data decoded, where we can see a snippet of the traffic that actually caused the alert to fire. It looks like it's reaching out to a host called ishibati.com, uh, and it's posting to cartos slash uu.php. So all of that looks pretty suspicious to me. Uh, if I want to further investigate, I can click on this icon, once again, left click, go to Actions, PCAP, and we'll open that in a new browser tab, and we'll see the full PCAP for this traffic. From the initial establishment, uh, on port 80, we've got our SYN, SYNAC, ACK. We could see the traffic itself moving in various packets, and then the shutdown of the connection. If we want a transcript of this, we can do that by clicking on this transcript button here. It'll show everything. If we want to get rid of the hacks, we can turn that off and we'll see just a transcript of the connection. We are posting to this PHP page and in response, we are getting this encoded data. So this definitely looks like something malicious is going on with this machine. Let's go back to our alerts page. And since we're pretty sure this is something malicious, we'll click on the escalate button. That is this uh, triangle with the exclamation point in it that will escalate to a new case And then when we open up our cases interface, we'll see our case is right here. So now that we've escalated into our cases interface, we can use this as a central uh, recording point for our investigation. We'll click on the binoculars icon here to open up the case itself. We can take a look at the cases interface. Up here at the top is the title of the case. By default, it just uses the rule name of the alert that was escalated. But if we want to change that to something more meaningful, we can change that by simply clicking on it and saying potential ZBot infection on 192.168.3.65. So that'll give us a brief summary and a human readable case name that we can share with the other analysts. Over on the right hand side of the screen here, you'll see there's some uh, case attributes that we can set up. If we want to assign this to an analyst, we can do that. I'll assign this to myself. If we want to set a status, we can do that as well. I'm going to set this to in progress because I'm actively investigating this case right now. Um, any analyst who logs in, they can go to the cases interface and it will show them which open cases they have to deal with. So it's a good sort of workflow tool. If you have stuff that you need to hand off, they'll be able to go in and, and see that it's open there. Uh, we can set the details of the case, the severity and the priority. Uh, those are set in accordance with whatever your internal procedures are. You may have uh, higher severity for higher severity alerts. You may have higher severity for particularly sensitive hosts. Uh, that's up to you. Uh, the cases interface supports traffic light protocol. That is how much information that's in this case you're allowed to share and with whom. It also supports permissible actions protocol. That is, in your remediation efforts, what are considered permissible actions? How closely do you feel this is being monitored by an adversary? Uh, can you change things or, or probe things or upload files to VirusTotal, et cetera? Or are you more restricted in that way? We do have the capability to add categories. So you can either select something from the dropdown or you can add something new. We can call this malware C2. It will add that as a category. And now whenever somebody wants to select a category, it will be added to the list. There is also a tagging infrastructure, so if you want to tag stuff according to certain things, uh, perhaps the, the department where the endpoint is, or the section of the network, or the facility, or the data center, or whatever, uh, you can add those tags and then use them later to correlate and do reporting to figure out where your issues are. Up here, there is a comment field, so we can add our initial comments. Um, 
this case we found C2 traffic in Suricata. We'll add that. And it will add that. It will also tag it with the time, date, and the user who entered it. So if multiple analysts are collaborating on the same case, they can use the comments. Attachments is for attaching files to the case. So for example, if you have a procedure that says a screenshot must be taken after the malware is removed from a device and attached to the case, you can use this attachments functionality for that. Uh, you can also use it to take screenshots of other items and attach them or attach potentially malicious documents, whatever, whatever you need for your record keeping. Observables are individual artifacts that come up during the investigation, and we'll see that more in a moment. Events are the events that have been escalated from Security Onion into this case, which means they've been copied from the Security Onion database into the case's database to be retained as evidence for this investigation. Again, we'll talk about that more in a moment. And finally, history shows a full history of the case, any changes that were made, anything that was added or deleted or escalated or moved around will all be logged here for audit purposes. Going back to events, because we created this case by escalating an alert, the only event that is currently in here is the original alert. And if we open this, we'll see all the details about it. We can see the destination IP, we can see the uh, ingest timestamp, we can see the message itself, etc. Now, if we want to take this destination IP and add it as an observable, that's very easy. We just click on the little eyeball icon here, add as new observable. It will ask for a type. It recognizes this is an IP. This is the value. It was the destination IP. Uh, is this an indicator of compromise? Yes, we think so, because it was reaching out to this and it appears to be malicious. What is the traffic light protocol setting for this particular indicator, as opposed to the case as a whole? And then you can add tags if you like. When this is all set up the way you want, you can hit add, and it will add it to your observables menu. If there's something else you want to add, you can do that as well. Say we want to add our source IP so that we can keep track of exactly how many alerts we're getting for a particular source IP. We can do that as well. In this case, we'll provide an optional description. Add that. And now we've got our source IP and our destination IP in there as observables. So what do we have so far? We have a case in our case management system that says we have a potential ZBot infection on this machine. We have the destination IP, we have the source IP. Now we should probably pivot back to our alerts and see if we can do a little bit more investigation. So going back to the alerts page here, a uh, good place to start might be seeing what else we have in terms of alerts for this source IP. So we click on the IP, we can click on only, and what that'll do here in the alerts interface is it will give us only the alerts from the last 12 hours involving the IP address 192.168.3.65. As you can see, we've got 16 of them. Looks like we've got some more ZBot stuff. We have some more post requests to C2. Uh, we have some EXE downloads. So this machine is probably pretty thoroughly compromised with malware. If we want to pick one to investigate, we can take a look at the PEEXE or DLL Windows file download. It looks like it was downloading over port 80 from this particular source IP 18872243372. We can once again look at a packet capture of that, see what it really looks like. Scrolling down, it's this uu.php page again, and then it appears to be sending a malicious executable or at least unexecutable, something that starts with this program cannot be run in DOS mode. So there's something going on with this malicious IP address. If we go back to alerts, we can click on that IP address, the 18872, and pivot into our hunt interface. Now I'm not going to get too deep into hunt, that's really the focus of the next workflow on ad hoc hunting, but this allows us to look at all the information in Security Onion as opposed to just the stuff that raised an alert. So if we click on hunt and open that in a new tab, we'll see we're hunting for the IP address 18872243372 by event module and event data set. And we'll see we've got a lot of stuff here, including file and HTTP information from Zeek, uh, connection logs, notices, etc. If we want to concentrate on the files, we can do that. Click file and include. It'll add file to our query. 
So now we're saying anything with 18872243372 and data about files coming to or from that IP. If we scroll down, we'll see under MIME type, we have two different executable files here, both of which were downloaded to our endpoint at 3.65. Let's open one of those up for details. We'll see Zeke has analyzed it, pulled hashes, uh, extracted the executable information. It saved a copy for us here in case we need to do further analysis. But for a quick look, we can just click on the hash value, actions, and then pivot to virus total. That'll take that hash and look it up in virus total. This says 60 out of 68 vendors have flagged this as malicious, which seems like a pretty overwhelming majority to me. So this is probably malicious as well. Now what we can do from here, close this out, click on the escalate button and attach it to our case, our potential Zbot infection case. So that will escalate it to an existing case. If we go back to our case here, we look at events and then we refresh. We'll see there is our Zeek file information. We can open that up, add the MD5 hash as an observable. Yes, that's an indicator of compromise because it's malicious. Hit add, and now we have it in our catalog of observables for this case. So we've added that to our investigation. We not only have the IP address of the malicious server, but we also have the hash value of the malicious file. So now we can continue our investigation in a couple of different ways. We could go back to the alerts tab and check the other alerts that were generated by this source IP and look for other malicious traffic coming from it. Or we can hunt for indicators of compromise directly from this observables window using these crosshair icons. So if I wanted to see anywhere else in my environment that the malicious file hash showed up or anywhere else in my environment that this malicious server IP showed up, I could click here, it would open hunt in a new tab and then I can see any other machines on my network that may have reached out and, and talked to this malicious IP. So the observables do not just track one particular investigation, but they give us a really easy mechanism for tying together alerts and previous cases and the hunt interface in order to expand our investigation and make sure that we didn't miss anything. In conclusion, that's how the alert triage and case creation workflow functions in Security Onion. The alerts interface acts as a starting point for informing analysts about potentially malicious or problematic events on the network. The analysts can then review these alerts, choosing to either acknowledge and dismiss them or escalate them into cases for further investigation. And once something has been escalated into cases, that could be used to record the details of the investigation, including related events, observables, attachments, and more. I hope this video was useful for you. Please join us in the next one for more information about the hunt interface and ad hoc hunting for new and novel threats.